for this week, we um, have with us guests from our CRL lab of the Riverside campus. Um, and Catherine's going to be talking to us about uh, first aid and like the really essential components that everyone needs to know before they go into the field um, this summer. And just working with artifacts that come from a wet environment. Um, what you need to do to make sure you're going to have something to bring back and actually preserve in the lab later on. Think about <laughs> me when you bring stuff back. Yeah. <laughs> no fragments. Everything um, in one piece. <laughs> so without further ado, Chris. So I'm a graduate student here in the Nautical Archaeology Program, and I'm interested in artifact conservation, but this really has nothing to do with my research. I'm doing something else. But this was prompted by um, working out at Riverside and seeing um, projects that we keep getting in, not necessarily our projects, but other people's projects from around Texas. Um, <coughs> in terrible condition. And it's basically, it always comes down to if they had just done this one little step in the field, these wouldn't be coming back to us so rusty and ferric. And you know, once metal's gone to ferric, iron, you can't recover it. So all that archaeological data is lost. Somebody's paying money to have it excavated, somebody's having money to have it stored somewhere, somebody's paying money all the way along the line, and then what do you get? You can't really get any information from it. So those of you that have taken conservation classes, there really are some very simple ideas that you just kind of repeat over and over. But it always seems that those simple ideas are never done in the field. So I'm just going to take the time today to kind of go over what I consider first aid, essential steps just to keep your artifacts stable until it can get back to the laboratory or to a conservation lab, or if it's your own personal item, uh, back to your garage. <laughs> so, um, so the aims of first aid, I think most of us are nautical people, so um, I have a few things in here for terrestrial people, I didn't know who was going to come today. But I think as nautical people, we've all had first aid, and basically it's designed to preserve life, prevent further harm and also to promote recovery until you can get to more substantial, more sophisticated care. And think of it when you're in the field doing conservation, you want to do the same thing. Simple steps that preserve your artifact. Um, prevent further harm, that's a big one. Because <laughs> if you do nothing, this is definitely going to happen. And also promote recovery of information. We're all archaeologists. This is why we're actually digging stuff up and recovering things from mud and rivers and all kinds of fascinating high visibility sites. So <laughs> we want to be able to get it back to a, a state where you can actually get some information from it. And if it's going to fall apart or decay, that doesn't really do anybody any good. <clears throat> so as the saying goes, um, if it's wet, keep it wet. Mm -hmm. If it's dry, keep it dry. Now, if you just hold on to those two ideas, you're about halfway there. But the reason you keep things dry are for two very important principles. You have to deal with chlorides, carbonates, and sulfates that are actually absorbed into the material. And also the osmotic pressure due to water. And I'm just going to spend a, one minute kind of talking about that because as I go through different materials, you'll understand why certain things look the way they do in the field and why they start to exfoliate and fall apart right before your eyes. So when everything's near um, on the substrate, just underneath, partially buried, totally buried, covered over, rained on, dried, rained on, dried. It doesn't matter. It's always going to absorb something from whatever it's around, some matrix. And generally, that's going to be chlorides. Um, especially in the marine environment, it's going to be sodium chloride. Carbonates, they can be soluble and insoluble. We're all rec um, familiar with calcium carbonate. That's the calcareous adhesions that are on the outside. They usually have to bang off or air scrap out. There's also sol soluble carbonates that um, impregnate themselves into the material, and they don't really come out that easily. <clears throat> and there's also sulfates, and, and a lot of these items, especially chlorides, is, are what drives a lot of the corrosion process. So when you pick things up in the field, it's, all it wants to do is decay and corrode. So you need to do something to it to stabilize it, to prevent what's going on, just to arrest it, really, and get it um, to a place where it can be conserved. The idea with the osmotic pressure is when you have all these dissolved solids in your material that aren't very, that aren't going to migrate very easily, all water wants to do is equalize itself. And if you have a membrane, a material, glass or ceramic, and you have all these soluble solids and carbonates and chlorides on one side, 
they're not going to want to come out very easily. So water will want to go in to equalize that concentration. There's not a whole lot on the outside, so the water's going to go in to try to dilute what's inside. And that's going to make your item actually swell, because it's actually going to take up water. And depending on how um, degraded and decomposed your material is, or how flexible it is, water can enter very quickly, or it can enter very slowly, but while it's sitting on the deck, while you're taking your gear off, while you're rinsing off, while you're doing something, it can actually start pulling apart right in front of your eyes. So for things like wood, it's a bit flexible. Items like glass, ceramic, and actually stone, um, there's a type of stone that actually takes up a lot of these items as well. Um, those are the kinds of issues. They're not very flexible, but they will be taking up water. And that's where all the damage <coughs> occurs. So it's the chlorides, the carbonates, the sulfates that are absorbed in, into the item, and also that osmotic pressure, that movement of water trying to equalize that concentration. And just to, just to show you, this is a, an amphorae, um, both from a terrestrial site and a deep water site. Um, it's from the same period. And this is, you can see all the voids, the natural paste and fabric of the ceramic, where you have the natural voids. And after being uh, 400 meters, which is not that deep, they consider it deep water. But it's been down for 1,200 years. Did I do the math right? 1,800 years? Um, you can see all the voids have been taken up. And also, the larger voids are actually surrounded by all these carbonates. And so when you go to take this out of the water and you think, oh, I'm going to start desalinating it, getting ahead of the program, you start putting it in fresh water, what's going to happen is the water's going to rush in, nothing's really going to come out, and it's going to break. And then things like ceramics and glass, when they're made, <clears throat> they cool down and they provide, they have an inherent tension inside. And so when it starts to move, it actually starts to break in the spring. And you'll never get it back to the exact position that you had them for. So sometimes when it's wet, you want to keep it wet with the same water that it came out of. I know the impetus is always, use fresh water. Let's start the desalination process. But sometimes the best thing, if it's wet, keep it wet, but use the same water that it came out of. Which is not so bad because usually fresh water is an issue in the field anyway. So let's talk about glass, because everybody seems to find glass. Um, it can look a hundred different ways. But basically, it's three components, and it's the silica, the glass portion that everybody's familiar with. A flux that's added to bring the temperature of the melted glass down so they can actually heat it. And then stabilizers, stabilizers are added to, um, to work with it before it cools off. So you don't want something very stiff and you can't mold it, blow it, or anything. So usually there's these three components, and depending if it's, you heard of soda lime glass, it'll have soda as the flux, and lime as the stabilizer. What happens over time is this, these flux components leach out, and you end up with an airspace. And glass will look like layers of paper. And when it's wet, there's water inside all those layers. And so you look at it underwater, and it looks great, it looks shiny, it looks intact. As soon as you bring it up, that water starts to evaporate, and you've got air spaces. <clears throat> and the crystals, the salt crystals inside, because they're drying, they're actually expanding. And that's going to start popping off your surface. We call that spalling, we call that exfoliation. And I have a few examples. Um, Port Royal is a, a big project here at Texas A&M. And they found several thousands of these onion bottles. And <clears throat> this was a site that um, part of the harbor sunk in 1692. So it was mostly in the water for the 300 years. And these onion bottles, what happened sometimes when they had them up on the deck, between the time that they would actually get out of the water and take their gear off, this would go from being intact to basically looking like that, just on the dock. And so, just, you know, you can see it starting to dry out. It's, I really want to press upon you that minutes make a difference, especially when you're working with an inflexible material. Things start to happen very quickly and you can't go back. <laughs> it's horrible. And this is, these are just some more onion balls. You can see the, the type of flaking off that's going on. The lamination that you see in the glass, this is all the layers of glass. This is part of it that's that's actually come off. <clears throat> Some more delamination going on. And this is all from the leaching out of those components plus the salt that's absorbed by the glass and not going through a careful enough drawing process in a consolidation. 
um, at this point in the 80s, we were doing a lot of new techniques, and so we've got this down pretty good now. But that's what happens with glass. So even though when you bring it up, it looks great, within minutes it could just fall apart on you. So be very careful with glass. And once it starts to break, it starts to spring. And even if you try to put all these pieces back together again, they just wouldn't ever fit up again. And, and it's very typical of glass, very typical of ceramics. Um, we have a student working on a Port Royal, Port Royal onion bog right now that this is what she started with. You can see all the mud and the sand that's still in it. And then she recovered all these um, flakes that have come off the, the part of the glass as well. Now you can't, we do a lot of magical things here, but we can't do anything with that. <laughs> so we just put it, put it aside, clean it, take all the sand out. But you cannot, you know, the, you don't know what kind of maker's marks. And it's the surface that we're really trying to, as archaeologists, trying to you know, protect. That's where all of your maker's marks are, your um, tool marks, any owner's marks, and incisions, or anything. And if, if you lose that original surface, you've lost a lot of information. And this is another small piece of glass. You can see that this is just what glass can do. It just exfoliates, and it gets that iridescence. And again, that's because you're looking at air going through glass and light, light bends, and so it gives you that rainbow. So anytime you see glass that looks a little iridescent, rainbowy, you know it's starting to decompose. So when it keeps going, it looks like this. And it just, it just takes, it's done at that point. So ceramics, um, because our unfired ceramics are very porous, they can take up a lot of salt. And if it's a very um, soluble salt, as soon as it starts to dry, as the water comes out of the material, it brings those salts with it. And then they crystallize on the surface. <coughs> This is just a very powdery white, basically salt. And that's an extreme example. I don't know if you can tell what it is, but it's a Roman oil lamp. Not that big. So um, that one definitely needed desalination, but not in that way. So, and this is another um, piece of ceramic where you had salts underneath the surface that as it dried, those salts got bigger because they dried, crystals get bigger. And it just falls off the surface. And, and again, you lost all of any, if you had any decoration there, any painting. Um, and then it's just very fragile to touch. You know, as an archaeologist, you want to be able to touch things. That's what we try to do as conservators is to stabilize things. But these can be very tricky. And then some minor, and you see this a lot on, on ceramics. This is just underneath <coughs> the surface where you've got that spalling starting to um, occur. And then when it actually flakes off, you get these pits. And that's just on the surface. So that's a minor um, example. And brick also goes through it. Um, some of you may be doing some submerged cities um, or harbor areas. Brick is a very porous material and it takes up salts as well. Um, they actually use some of the brick that was recovered from Port Royal that was used in the paving for part of the seawall. And if you go to Port Royal now, you can see areas of the seawall that are just there, you can almost put your hand right through it. Because the bricks that they brought up were not desalinated. And all those salts have been coming out, and it's just you've been eroding brick. So um, people don't usually think of brick, and we get it in every once in a while. So this is definitely something that also can have a problem. And anybody that's done any home improvement, as soon as you buy bricks, you get this weight of fluorescence. And there's several reasons for that, but it's not archaeological, so I won't go into it. Um, stone. People have three ways of dealing with stone. Do nothing. Do absolutely nothing. Do positively absolutely nothing. And that's not the right attitude. Because there's three, ty three different types of stone. There's igneous, which is a granite basalt obsidian. Everybody is kind of familiar with all that. It's a very dense, compact um, material. There's metamorphic stone, which is caused by lots of pressure. Um, that's typically marble, slate, and quartzite, and it's, again, it's a very um, non, it's porous to a point, but it, it is a very dense, compact stone, and so generally when you're going, when you're covering these things, uh, projectile points, I can't think of anything else. Column drums. Column drums. <laughs> we have a picture, actually, of some of that. Um, marble, of course, anything underwater for 2,000 years is going to have an effect. Water's going to have an effect on it, even if it's marble from lots of things other than the water. But basically, the type of stone you have to deal with is the sedimentary stone. And those are items uh, made from sandstone, 
limestone, alabaster, and shale. And again, it's, it's formed by just layers and layers and layers and layers. And so you can think of it again as that glass.